Hello, my name is Thomas. I'm going to talk to you uh, about a general uh, FPV problem uh, when you combine uh, long-range transmitters and video receivers. Uh, we get problems. Often we get problems. Those two problems are the video overdrive and uh, video harmonics. So I'm going to make a little drawing and uh, explain a little bit about the long-range uh, transmitter. It is. Uh, Decide to be working in the 433 to 440 megahertz. This is the wanted frequency. This is the frequency we want to be as strong as possible. The stronger the better, the longer range we get. The video receiver um, is they're designed to be working in the 1.3 and 2.4 gigahertz. Those are the two uh, main video frequency uh, ranges we often see people use. As it is, all transmitters will have harmonics. It is impossible to design any transmitter without harmonics. So, uh, let's, uh, let's see how the harmonics goes. So, 433 times 3 is 1299. And 440 times 3 is 1320. So, even if the long range transmitter got a very, very good uh, bandpass filter, so this means the harmonics are actually within and way below legal limits of harmonics, they will still be uh, there. They will be weak, very weak, but they will be there. They will be detectable by sensitive video receivers. So, if you adjust your video receiver to a frequency within this range, you will have shorter video range due to the harmonics. All right. This is the harmonic problem. Then there is the overdrive problem, and that is a completely different problem. Um, so. The, as I said, the fundamental, the wanted frequency, is anything between this frequency range. And um, let's uh, make a little drawing. We have a, an amplifier. We have a bandpass filter. Bandpass filter. And our antenna. So we emit 500 milliwatts. And very close to this long range transmitter, we have a video receiver. The video receiver also got some sort of a bandpass filter, if you're lucky. So, this is a bandpass filter. Let's take the worst band. It is for 1.3. So, this is the center frequency. And then we have a mixer. Uh, the mixer and an oscillator, and then we have the video out. So, in the ideal world, if this band filter got absolutely no attenuation for the wanted frequency and a perfect attenuation for uh, the unwanted frequencies, our uh, frequency range, then you could put them as close to each other as you want. You will not have any kinds of problems for the for the fundamental for the wanted frequency. However, it is not uh, an ideal world because the video receivers must be compact, cheap, so cheap so we actually want to buy them for our hobby products. So this bandpass filter is often very poorly designed. It is not designed to be able to work within uh, one to two meters distance from such a powerful transmitter, even if it is far, far away in frequency. So, so the fundamental will go through this bandpass filter and it will overdrive the oscillators and, and even some of those uh, with the best range, they got a, a gain block, a low noise amplifier in the front. So you have very good range um, on your video side. However, those gain blocks, the amplifier here, works from 100 megahertz to 5 gigahertz and is only limit, limited by the bandpass filter in front of this amplifier. 
So if this one is badly designed, you will overdrive the amplifier and, uh, and, and jam any, any of the video, no matter what channel you select. So if you see, no matter what kind of channel you are, you're using, and you get exactly the same distance to your transmitter, then you know it is uh, an overdrive problem. Okay? If your problem changes, it gets better or worse uh, when you change this to the channel, then you know it is a harmonics problem. Then you can yeah, then you can fix it by adding another harmonics filter to this one. Uh, or if it is an overdrive problem, uh, you need to add a bandpass filter on the video receiver. So uh, that was a little bit about video overdrive and uh, video harmonics. I'm going to talk to you about weak signals, strong signals, and jamming. How to jam uh, the long range and the normal range receivers. And, and how to avoid it, obviously. We have seen uh, some people test and uh, try to test uh, our receiver's performance by doing some, uh, some experiments. And uh, we want to address this uh, back with some answers about uh, what, uh, what to expect and uh, how it works. So, let's talk about how to, um, how to jam uh, our receiver system. So if you have the RX and you have a TX. So if you want to jam this receiver, you, you make the signal, the wanted signal, uh, very weak by uh, adding uh, an attenuator and then the antenna here. So now it is a weak signal and then the receiver is still working. So this is the wanted signal. The wanted signal. So then um, we have seen people taking uh, an, another transmitter called the jamming without an alternator and locate this very close to the receiver. I draw two antennas on the receiver because we got uh, two antennas, obviously. So, why is it possible to jam the receiver when you put uh, a strong transmitter in the same band as this receiver is receiving? And uh, why isn't it just ignoring the very, very strong signal uh, as, uh, as you would expect? I can explain exactly why this happened. Because this receiver, um, from the specification, uh, got uh, about 100 and for minus 114 dBm sensitivity, uh, if it is uh, the long range receiver, for example. And this, um, it can also handle uh, plus 10 dBm. So this, this is 124 dB dynamic range this receiver can actually handle. Uh, so this is a, a huge difference in, in signal levels. Um, why is this possible? I, I need to make a drawing uh, of the receiver front end. So um, we got an antenna and a bandpass filter. Low noise amplifier and a switch. Then we got another amplifier, bandpass filter and antenna. Then we have the, the radio, the radio chip. Okay, so this low noise amplifier got a very good, uh, very high gain and uh, extremely low uh, noise figure. So uh, within uh, the wanted band, it will generate a much stronger signal in here. Um, this uh, bandpass filter is specially optimized uh, to have very, very little attenuation to the wanted frequency and uh, the best attenuation uh, at the two frequency bands people use, uh, 1.3 and 2.4 GHz. Uh, this filter got extremely uh, good attenuation. This means you can locate uh, a transmitter very close to the receiver in those bands and not disturb the receiver's performance. 
But this jamming signal is not in another band. It is inside the band. So it goes straight through the bandpass filter, obviously. Then, even if this signal is stronger, uh, is, uh, is not strong enough to overdrive uh, the first stage of amplification, then we have this switch. And this switch got only three, 30 dB isolation. Uh, so this means we can, we can switch this and uh, figure out which antenna is uh, the most uh, is the best for the for the polarization or the, the dropouts and, and so on for the diversity system, and uh, we figured uh, because of uh, our vertical and horizontal uh, diversion uh, diversity error, uh, the the signal difference will be a maximum 26 dB. So that means uh, it is correct uh, correct design to select uh, an RF switch with with only 30 dB uh, isolation because we only need 26 really. So. If uh, this uh, receiver is uh, maybe got the wrong antenna and it was uh, kind of overdrived by this strong transmitter to, to figure out, oh, this is the good antenna and it's actually not the good antenna, then, then the difference between the wanted and uh, the unwanted signal could be too much for, for the radio chip to, to handle and then it will be overdriven uh, as well. So, and, and even if you are out of the band, or if you're not even in lock with the, with the wanted frequency, then this wanted signal can also, if you go a little bit closer to it, go, go straight through the antenna, and then overdrive, uh, overdrive the radio front end, and that means if it's, it is uh, overdriven, uh, then you cannot receive anything at all. So, this is, it is impossible to design uh, a system uh, who doesn't have a, a problem like this really. So, so, and it is also a, a completely unrealistic scenario in a, in, a, in a flight situation. You will never put a, a, a huge attenuation uh, on your transmitter uh, and you will not fly in that close uh, as you need to, to jam it uh, unless you uh, fly a hundred kilometers away and then uh, try to hit uh, a tetra band t tower or anything else uh, using uh, a frequency very close to the in band uh, frequency. About the long range receiver and the diversity system, uh, you need to know a little bit about how it works and how to avoid getting into serious problems with it, and then you can optimize your system so you get most benefit out of the diversity system. So the long range receiver got diversity. So what is diversity really? Um, diversity is, uh, is made by having two antennas. And uh, inside the long range receiver, we then have, um, I'm gonna simplify this uh, schematic a little bit, just uh, drawing a, a switch and then the radio, the radio chip. Okay, so what the long range receiver do is it listen on one antenna and uh, it will get a good package. After the good package, it will very short why there is still a transmission on the right frequency and all that. There is, we actually send out a dummy byte after the checksum. So, so the receiver will, will know exactly when to look and it switches over to the other antenna and then if the RSSI signal that is the signal strength uh, indicator so if the RSSI gets higher it stays on the new antenna if it gets lower it switches back because then this one is the strongest signal and then the frequency hopping and all this. You already know how this works, I guess. Um, so, as I already told about this RF switch, it got about 30 dB isolation. So that means that means I when I select this one, I I I don't have a perfect you know a perfect switch. Uh, on high frequencies, uh, perfect uh, switches doesn't really exist. 
and if they exist, they cost uh, thousands of dollars. So I'm sorry, but uh, 30 dB is uh, good enough for, for the product when it is used correctly. So, about diversity signals, uh, polarization problems. If you have a horizontal or a vertical antenna on your transmitter or your receiver side, uh, let's say if you have uh, both the antennas uh, point up, then you have the, the best link. And if uh, one of the antennas goes vertical or horizontal, then you have a polarization problem. Then the attenuation by wrong polarization is uh, minus 26 dB. That is a worst case if you have a perfect uh, cor phase correct signal. I already posted a, a video that explains uh, uh, exactly how this works by the little uh, bulb that is uh, uh, turning uh, on and off when you turn the antennas. This shows very uh, well the isolation of uh, correct and uh, wrong polarization. So, what is the worst thing you can do with this system? If you take away one antenna, okay, and at the same time you attenuate the wanted signal, so we have a, a, a wanted signal and we have a wrong, wrong polarization. Okay, then we have a jamming signal. with good polarization. Okay, let's say the two transmitters, they are uh, transmitting at the same power, uh, maybe maybe the one that is at 500 milliwatts and the, the jamming is at 1 watt or 2 watts. And um, let's say this receiver is, uh, is uh, on the right antenna and you are flying further and further away. And then because of the wrong polarization, you get minus 26 dB. That is a lot less signal than the, than the jamming signal. Okay? And this attenuator only got 30 dB isolation. So, sooner or later, those two diff, uh, hopping systems, they will maybe hop on the same frequency. And the, two, um, and the signals will maybe be added. And if this happens, and I am at this switch, at that very little milliseconds, I go on this, and then the signal actually actually get higher because I just have 30 dB isolation. It is easily possible to do this. Then I will stay at the wrong antenna, assuming the signal is actually stronger because I measured it to be stronger. And then what happens? The one signal is now attenuated 30 dB more because I expect there will be good signal here next at next package. Then I will of course get out of sync, and I will not return until I uh, start a, a full uh, rescan process. So this takes another one and a half seconds, and uh, if if it still doesn't work, then it will uh, recall failsafe. So the long-range receiver must always have two antennas, uh, especially when combined with a very strong jamming signal. At a uh, normal operation. You will not have this strong jamming signal, or if you have a, low, a very strong jamming signal, then you will at least at the same time have uh, both antennas connected to it. Then you will not have this problem. Then you will stick to the right antenna and you will still be able to handle a very strong jamming signal. I'm going to talk to you about uh, long range system receivers and the supply voltage to the receivers. Uh, what is important and uh, how to get into problems and how to fix problems with uh, supply voltage uh, on the, the plane side. So I need to tell you a little bit about how the receivers are designed um, and uh, how they are specified, the specification of the voltage ranges. So we're going to take the long range first, the long range receiver. Uh, specified for 4 to 6 volts. Um, this is the voltage range where, where you will uh, expect full performance, uh, absolutely uh, best stable performance. Uh, we did optimize uh, all the electronics to, uh, to 5 volts. So 5 volts is, uh, this is the voltage we, uh, we designed it for. But we guarantee uh, full performance are, uh, from 4 to 6 volts. 
So um, I'm going to draw a little line like this. One, two, three, four, five, six volts. And here is zero volts. Um, so from four to six. Okay. This is uh, this is the voltage range we specified. So uh, obviously, uh, any user will figure out if you go outside of the specified voltage range, we will not guarantee any kinds of uh, behavior or malfunction. Uh, of course, uh, people did try to go outside uh, the normal range and they figured out if you put in 100 volts, it will blow up, it will not work, and if you uh, go to zero volts, it will also not work. Uh, I'm sorry guys, uh, I cannot fix those problems. Uh, also, uh, some people figured out if you go down to 2.5 volts, even at 2.5 volts, half of half of the normal voltage range it still works. So, so, so this is uh, this is we got a huge margin. So this is uh, our margin. And this is our specification. There's a, another problem. If you go below this, obviously you are already below what we specified, but if you go below this voltage and up again, you would uh, normally expect it will work again. Uh, that is not always true with electronics. Um, because uh, our receivers are actually uh, full of uh, very uh, critical and uh, delicate electronics. Some of this uh, can uh, lock up or go into an undefined state. So if you go below this voltage, it will maybe lock up or go into something. And then you go back, maybe uh, the microcontroller actually starts to work again or maybe it doesn't. Uh, it is unspecified what happens, really. We cannot uh, guarantee anything below this. So, um, so why is this important? It is important if you have a badly designed plane or a wrongly configured plane or you used uh, components of uh, bad or wrong specifications. Uh, it is very typical uh, to buy a BEC of so and so many amps. And we kind of joke around with it and call it China amps because amps is not really amps. They say five amps and it blow ups with amp, one amp if you load it continuously with one amp. So it is uh, a, pretty much a joke what is written on, on remote control stuff you buy. I'm sorry about it, but that is really the, the fact. And also, uh, the, the servos you connect to your receiver, you don't really know uh, the average current, the loaded current, the peak current, or is there an unspecified soft circuit current, maybe? Uh, we, we found in some uh, servos, they actually short circuit um, the supply voltage for a very short time, but it actually is a short circuit because of the uh, the drivers to drive the motor uh, is turned on on the high side and the low side at the same time. So it is actually short circuiting uh, the power supply. So this will obviously jam uh, delicate receivers, unscrewing displays, uh, cameras, and uh, return to home systems, uh, unscrewing displays. You'll get stripes on your pictures. You will get all sorts of uh, faulty uh, problems. So the trick is, uh, you find out and you do something about it. So the trick is to deliver uh, rock steady um, supply voltage to your delicate electronics and then you'll have a very good and reliable performance. What we already did in, uh, in the receivers, I'm going to explain a little bit more about how the receivers uh, are actually designed to handle a, a lot of this bad stuff. Uh, we have uh, the 5 volt supply. Then we have a diode and a capacitor. So this means if there is a short dropout in the in the supply voltage, then we'll still be able to live on the voltage on the capacitor. On this uh, internal voltage, this is this is the this voltage also goes to all the servos. So this is the BEC and all the servos. They are of course connected together. On the supply line. So here now we are inside the receiver. 
Then we have two regulators. One is 2.5 volts. This is for the radio chip. And then we have another one, 3.3 volts for the CPU. Okay, the long range receiver also got uh, front side low noise amplifiers. They run on 5 volts, so they're connected to this point. So, so the, the two LMA, two of them are supplied on this 5 volt bus. Okay, so this means the long range receiver is a little bit more uh, prone to, to, to errors if you have a, an unstable uh, BEC voltage. If you've got the dropouts uh, uh, that is below the specified uh, uh, 4 to 6 volts for longer time than what we can handle from the capacitor, then you can get into troubles. The, the normal range receiver hasn't got those low noise amplifiers, so this means the capacitors will be able to hold up the voltage uh, a little bit longer, so uh, it doesn't reveal a pool system that easy. So let's uh, let's put it in another way. Let's put a battery in here. We put in a nine volts battery and a regulator, so everything is fine. So we we don't reveal a poorly uh, supplied system. So you can fly around with a, a poor poorly underspecified uh, BEC and servos that's uh, possibly driving uh, so much current they are very very close to reset or, or shut down the PEC. Is, is this a good way to, to solve a bad problem uh, on a plane? I'm sorry not. We want to reveal the, the voltage is not good. So it's good to detect this and to figure out there is actually a problem and uh, then you fix it. How can you fix this? Yeah, you can, you can measure the voltage, the BEC voltage, uh, with a scope and then check the voltage is within the specified range for the components you uh, connect to this uh, voltage and then you are fine. Uh, maybe you need to change a uh, brand or type. Also, you can do another trick. Uh, we already did this in, uh, in some of our receivers. We added a very big capacitor uh, on this uh, 5 volt supply directly on the receiver. Uh, it is a very big and uh, very strong uh, capacitor and it will handle the, the very very big currents uh, from the servos. Uh, it will not solve a completely faulty or completely dead uh, or a completely wrong uh, type of PEC. Obviously a capacitor cannot store a, a current for a for long time, it is only for a short time. So if this fails then you will fail. So I think that was uh, what I wanted to say about uh, receivers and uh, water supplies.